Okay, so thank you very much for coming to our webinar. So good evening and afternoon to our Australian audiences and good morning to our European audience. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Entering the German Market, a guide for Australian technology companies. My name is Michael Henderson and I'm speaking to you from Frankfurt where I'm a senior business development manager. Before we get started, I'd like to take you through a few housekeeping items. To reduce background noise, all microphones will be muted during the webinar, apart from the person speaking. Please note that the audio quality may fluctuate during the webinar. At the end of the presentations, our speakers will be taking questions. We'll be using Slido to facilitate these questions. In order to ask a question, please go to slido.com, enter the event code, hashtag tech, capital D, capital E, and the passcode FZMBOH. The slider will also appear on the right-hand corner of your screen as well. I'll be repeating these instructions during our Q&A. Please note as well that Austrade is recording this webinar session, and we may make the recorded version of the webinar and all audio and visual elements accessible to internal Austrade staff and the general public via the website austrade.gov.au and other communication means. So attendees who are not in agreement may exit the webinar now. So I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Paul Kenner, Trade Commissioner Frankfurt and Deputy Consul General at the Australian Consulate in Frankfurt. So Paul, over to you. Michael, good evening for those here in Australia and good morning for my colleagues in Germany. My name is Paul Kenner. I'm Austrade's Trade Commissioner designate for Germany and it's my pleasure to be welcoming you to today's session where we'll be providing insights and discussing opportunities for Australian technology companies looking at entering the German market. As part of today's webinar, we are also launching our updated report, Entering the German Market, a guide for Australian technology companies. I'd like to begin today's session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I'm speaking to you from today. Where I am here in Melbourne is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also extend my respects to the traditional custodians of the various lands where each of you are joining today. Before we get into our panel discussion, I want to take a few moments to provide a brief overview of the German market and opportunities for Australian tech companies looking to enter the market. So let's take a closer look. Needless to say, Germany is an economic powerhouse and a mature, highly competitive market. Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, the largest economy in Europe, and the largest net contributor to the EU budget. With a population of 83 million, Germany is the world's third largest trading nation and currently exports account for 47% of GDP. Industry is very much at the heart of Germany's strong export performance. The country is a competitive and innovative world leader in sectors such as vehicle manufacturing, mechanical and plant engineering, and chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Germany's economy has recovered well post the pandemic and despite high inflation, GDP is forecast to increase slightly over the coming year and improvement on earlier forecasts in part due to the easing of the energy crisis. In September 2021, Germany elected a new Bundestag. Reforming the EU to become a more sovereign bloc as well as transitioning its own economy and society to a highly digitalised and climate neutral one remains the government's key priorities. Due to the impact of the war in Ukraine and rising energy prices, the government has had to slow the pace of its plans in some areas. But nevertheless, the German government is moving ahead with its, zero, uh, with its net zero decarbonisation agenda and wants to put Germany in the top 10 of Europe's best digital performers by 2025. The technology sector is one of the most important branches in Germany. With an annual turnover of 178 billion euros in 2021, the IT industry is a major economic driving force and it is growing steadily. With over 1.3 million skilled workers at the end of 2022, the IT sector is also the second biggest industrial employer. Increasing productivity, as well as the decarbonisation of product and production processes are a shared ambition across Germany's technology sectors. Importantly, we can't talk about German technology without mentioning Industry 4.0, a national strategic initiative from the German government aimed to ensure an industry fit for future manufacturing in Germany. Industry 4.0 refers to the intelligent networking of machines and processes for industry with the help of information and communication technology. 
It promises to increase manufacturing productivity levels by up to 50% and likewise decreases the number of resources required by half. This is important for Germany as the country is facing significant challenges both present and future, including digitalization, an aging workforce, climate change, and a significant pace, increased pace of innovation. If Germany wants to continue its role as one of the world's most competitive and innovative manufacturing industry sectors, it must maintain its technological leadership in industrial production, research, and development. So with that in mind, Germany has, had, has both challenges and opportunities that businesses and governments are working hard to address, and this provides opportunities for Australian technology companies. Firstly, overall digitalization in Germany is sluggish. In a 2022 European Commission survey, Germany was ranked 13th out of, EU, out of the EU economies, just behind France. Similarly, AI is an important part of the technology of the future, and yet Germany recognises it lags behind key markets, such as the US and China. The pandemic has brought these issues home as industry, financial institutions and governments have all struggled to provide digital services and facilitate business online. Climate change is another challenge facing this market. Germany is Europe's largest energy consumer and a significant energy importer. It aims to become greenhouse gas neutral by 2045 and has set preliminary targets of cutting emissions by at least 65% by 2030. This will require German industry to adopt technological solutions to improve productivity, monitor efficiency levels and reduce energy consumption. Space and defence are also opportunities of significance. For space, Germany has identified this sector and its technologies as important future contributors to Germany's overall economic prosperity and security. Whilst a renewed focus on European defence is also driving interest in technology development and acquisition in areas including secure communications and cloud services. So before I hand over, some key points I want to leave you with today. Firstly, Germany is an economic powerhouse and a key partner for Australia. The country is a significant importer as well as exporter of tech, digital, IT, ICT solutions. Secondly, Industry 4.0 has gone well, but Germany recognises that efficiencies and performance need to be improved to maintain Germany's world-leading position. Thirdly, Germany is committed to achieving significant net zero targets by 2030 and 2045 in energy, industry, transportation and agriculture. And lastly, Germany's domestic industry recognises it cannot do this alone, and in many cases are open to sourcing proven solutions from abroad. So thank you. I'll now like to pass you over to one of, um, back to Michael uh, to launch the guide. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so as we've heard, Germany is a powerful market, drawing the interests of the best and the brightest from around the world. Uh, Australian tech companies have the innovations that Germany needs, and Australian tech companies have the opportunity to find success in Germany. However, Germany is a mature market and there's a lot of local and international competition. This is why we are launching our updated guide, Entering the German Market, a guide for Australian technology companies. It covers key things that Australian tech companies need to know when they start looking at Germany as a market for export or expansion. Before we begin, I'd like to thank those companies and organizations that greatly assisted us with the updated version through both reviewing the contents and proposing suggestions for updating the material such as base to services, speed 3D, liquid state, smart parking, and members of the German Australian Business Council. Now, the guide may look straightforward, but many companies often overlook this information before they start out. First of all, I'd like to cover a few of the common mistakes made by Australian companies when they look at the German market. Many of these mistakes can be attributed to not doing sufficient research before coming to Germany. Next slide, please. So, number one, thinking you can operate in Germany just as you do in Australia. German business culture may look very similar to Australia, but that doesn't mean it is. It has its own way of doing things, and Australian companies need to recognize this. So, some examples. So, while German business culture has become more informal, there are still key ways to show uh, respect. Titles are important in Germany, especially ones like doctor or professor, using them as a mark of respect. Then we have German expectations regarding business meetings. So German meetings are very content driven and people expect a clear business related reason for the meeting. Informal meetings or catching up over coffee tend to only occur once a good relationship has been established. Number two, Germany is an economic powerhouse of Europe and as a result is a great place for quick wins. 
It is an economic powerhouse, but the quick wins, that's a little harder. So going hand in hand with this more conservative business culture, German businesses can be conservative in their business decisions. German businesses often have long-standing relationships with peers, partners, and suppliers that may be located in the same city or neighboring town as well as overseas. They are unlikely to quickly switch to a new supplier unless they are confident in the relationship with you and your company. Having a shared network of contacts often helps build this confidence, as does regular face-to-face -face contact. This shows commitment to the business relationship. And number three, a popular misconception, I, gain, I can gain commercial traction and still run all of my German sales and networking from Australia. Doing everything over the internet from Australia will not build long-term customers. Finding buyers in Germany for your product or service does take time, and it relies heavily on making, maintaining regular contact and often a face-to-face -face presence. It's important to consider how your company will best achieve this. It could be through regular visits to Germany, a joint venture, a partnership, a distributor, a local contractor, or an overseas office. Incidentally, German businesses often like to have someone in the same time zone to speak to if they have a question or problem. This is particularly true for data-sensitive sectors like health, cyber, and finance. Looking at these mistakes, what should Australian tech companies consider when looking at the German market? Here are a few from the guide. Number one, a clear articulation of a unique selling proposition on how it relates to Germany and market demand. Australian tech companies need to articulate a clear USP and how it relates to Germany, how your product or service contrasts with your competition in market, and the company's track record of sales success in Australia and, if possible, in Europe or elsewhere in the world. Two, Networking, developing key stakeholder relationships is vital to building your reputation and business in Australia. As mentioned, German businesses often have long-standing relationships with peers, partners, and their entire supply chain. Having shared contacts is important. Some avenues for building networks. So you can ask Austrade for guidance. Uh, you can get a membership in one of Germany's trade associations. There are over 15,000 German trade associations covering all sectors and they can assist members with networking and fostering partnerships. For startups, Germany's incubators, accelerators, and co-working spaces can provide networking opportunities and advice on funding. Finally, business associations can assist with networking, including the German-Australian Business Council and the Australia-Germany Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Three, IP and data protection. Like all markets, ensure your IP paperwork is in order before you come to Germany. And looking at data protection, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, is a Europe-wide law governing the collection, storage, and transfer of personal data. Australian tech companies must understand how the GDPR relates to their product or service and ensure compliance if required. So, good. Good news, uh, data protection is part of Australian business culture, and this often puts us ahead of competitors. And a very key point, Australian businesses that can demonstrate compliance with the GDPR will have an advantage over companies that can't. Four, the importance of incorporation, taxation, employment. You need to identify in-market partners to help you with this. So, incorporation in Germany can demonstrate to customers and associations you're committed to the market. Incorporation can be particularly important for newer stage companies looking for German or EU funding. You need to find employment, tax, and legal advisors in Germany. Australian companies should quali consult qualified legal advisors prior to signing any contracts. Where possible, it's important to find advisors with knowledge of German and Australian legal and tax systems. For example, the Australia, Australia and Germany have a double taxation agreement, so a tax advisor is key for taking advantage of this. And aside from Austrade, Australian companies can ask other Australian companies in Germany and organizations in Germany for possible suggestions. These networks are very important for that. So, next slide, please. The points uh, below me show some of what the guide has to offer, and we hope that you will find it helpful on your road to success in Germany. And we will be sharing this presentation after the webinar. Okay, at this point, I'd like to move on to the panel discussion, where you hear from three panelists with a great deal of experience 
in the German market. If you have questions for our panelists, please go to www.slido.com and enter the event code, hashtag tech, tech large scale DE, and the passcode uh, FZMBOH as on your screen. We will answer your questions in the Q&A following the panel discussion. So I'd like to introduce now our three panelists. Uh, Jessica Walker is head of marketing at Base2 Services. She's based in Berlin. Dr. Stefan Bayer is non-executive director of Speed 3D, also based in Berlin. And finally, Philip Andrews is director and co-founder of Liquid State, speaking to us from Brisbane. So welcome everyone to the panel. So uh, at this point, Jessica, could you give us a quick one minute elevator pitch for base to services, please? Sure. Hi to everyone in Australia and Germany. Um, I'm Jessica Walker. I'm head of marketing of base to services. Uh, base to services is a leading cloud delivery and operations company. We specialize in DevOps, AWS and cloud native computing. Um, Base of Services offers consulting and a managed service called DevOps as a Service to small to medium sized um, companies and SaaS companies um, so that these companies can get the most out of the cloud um, and as well as scale and grow in their markets. Uh, we have a global customer base and our head office is located in Melbourne and we also have an office in the US and our Berlin office. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Stefan, could you give us a quick one minute elevator pitch for Speed 3D, please? Yes, uh, with pleasure. Hi, my name is Stefan. Um, I'm with Speed 3D. Speed 3D is a Melbourne based uh, technology company um, producing and uh, developing a, a large scale 3D printers uh, in metal. Uh, those printers are being used uh, mostly in, in defense currently, but also other um, uh, vertical markets like oil and gas and mining and also industry. Uh, it's an organization of 60 people with operations in obviously in Melbourne, the headquarters and then in, in the US and here in Germany. So we're selling globally. And my role there is being the sort of like the international uh, element to, to the board of directors. Hey, thank you very much. And Philip, uh, one minute elevator pitch for Liquid State, please. Uh, Liquid State is a uh, international communications uh, solutions company. Uh, we have two sides to the company. One is bespoke communication solutions, mainly in the health space, and the other is a platform play that provides similar kind of functionality, but at a lower cost point and more off the shelf kind of provision. Uh, we uh, derive most of our uh, income from uh, Europe um, and it's a multilingual pro provision and we're in six different countries. Uh, it's a Brisbane-based company, uh, started out working in enterprise communications and basically found our way into health uh, with some technology that's quite unique and uh, the German market loves it. So uh, we're very happy about that. Always good to hear that the German market loves our technology. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, so we'll start the panel discussion off with a question. So the main question is going to be, of course, why Germany? Why did you look at Germany? So, uh, Jessica, would you like to start us off? I have to unmute. <laughs> um, sure. Um, so, for Basel Services, there were really two reasons why we actually decided on Germany. The first one is that we offer 24-7 um, support. And so, we have a global customer base. So, we are actually looking to um, build a follow the sun support model which means we have um, our main team in Melbourne, we had a team in the US and now we needed a team in the European time zone. So uh, that's why we were looking at, at Europe expansion um, for that reason. Now we chose Germany um, in particular because it's actually a very attractive market for Australian tech companies because they still have so many business opportunities for our business, we're in the cloud services business. So there is um, a very vibrant, um, small to medium sized business ecosystem here in Germany. It's a much bigger market than Australia um, and still a lot of potential for the digitalization that uh, Paul was actually mentioning. So um, 
coupled with that, you have a big interest in technology and innovation. So that just sort of made sense. And then we always see Germany as a stepping stone to Europe. Um, and we chose Berlin as um, a location because we had a look at sort of the major IT hubs. And for us, the biggest fit was Berlin as um, a vibrant startup and scale up scene. So um, that's why we wanted to base ourselves here. Okay, thank you. And Stefan, how about yourself? Well, um, so to speak to these, and you know, we're doing metal 3D printers, right? So it's something where we're actually producing large metal parts and that can go into different uh, applications, you know, and use cases. As I previously mentioned, uh, one of them is defense, but uh, in reality, what, when we look at the, the global 3D printing market, it's, it's a bit like, you know, the US and Europe are about the same size in, in terms of opportunities and, and market relevance. So being an Australian company, I think there's no other choice uh, than going abroad, you know, because the global market is really the market that we need to attack. So we need to have the presence in the US and in Europe. And if you're into producing metal parts, really uh, in order to crank open the European market, you need to have a presence in Central Europe or continental Europe, which is then preferably Germany. Uh, I have to say that also we're doing uh, quite quite a good deal of business with uh, with the UK, but that unfortunately through the Brexit has come to uh, 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 or create a more difficult situation. So it's also something that I want to make everybody aware is that the the UK left the European Union, uh, and that does have an impact on business. You know, it's not that you cannot open up the European market, continental European market by having just the presence in the UK. But for us, it was key to be in Germany because this is where uh, machinery is, this is where metal parts are, this is where the know-how is, and this is where the big demand is. Yeah, about equal in size to what was possible in the US. Hey, thank you. It's good. Yeah, thanks for reminding about Brexit because that is an important point. <laughs> so, and Philip, how about yourself? So our journey was a little bit different. Um, so about a decade ago, we had um, an initial platform for our technologies already built, uh, and we did that in Australia. Australia is a very small market. We thought that we had uh, matched the market needs quite well, but we wanted to test that in a larger market. And we looked around uh, the world to see where we could gain access to the market quickly. And um, at that time, Berlin was um, very hot in terms of uh, incubators, startup culture, um, accelerators. So we uh, we managed to get a position in the, an accelerator, um, took four of our key staff and positioned there for five months uh, and basically took our technology across uh, Europe from there using that as a base and to check that we were on the right track. So that was, that was a really good kind of opportunity. Um, we always had a focus on Europe though, because our co-founder is French and I've spent a lot of time working um, in Europe already. So uh, we always saw Europe as a, an additional market, not just Australia, and we always had a global focus. Um, Germany for us, um, I think in terms of the European market um, was always our best customer base and continues to be that. And I think it's our, our technology has developed in a particularly Germanic way. Uh, and so when we bring that technology back to Australia, um, I think that the Australians like the kind of technology uh, approach that we have. And I think we can um, attribute that largely to the amount of work that we've done uh, in Germany and the kind of impact that our customers have on our product because of that. Okay, thank you. So great reasons for, for why Germany. So now finding customers, this is a key point of interest, of course, for, for our audience. So how did you find customers in Germany? This time, actually, Philip, we'll go back to you to start. So um, we're, we're not German native speakers. And, uh, and so uh, we also don't have a Germanic heritage um, that's uh, recent. So um, we understand that the culture is different, the language is different, despite the fact that the Germans probably speak better English than I do. Um, at most meetings, if I try to speak German, um, I'm quickly told that we'll conduct the meeting in English. And um, uh, for us, it was always a situation that um, 
Sorry, just remind me again the question. I've just gone off on a tangent. So yeah, finding customers. All oh, right, thanks. Um, yeah, for us, uh, because of that lack of German background, um, networking was a major thing for us and partnerships and joint ventures. And so um, our penetration of the market is largely due to our great partners and our great um, uh, networking and joint ventures that we have. Um, and that's also the reason why we've spread out into the rest of Europe. So for us, it wasn't a matter of us being there um, and being at the forefront of the business. We have a lot of white label solutions. We have a lot of solutions that have um, other people driving uh, the, the kind of sales and marketing efforts uh, and we're providing the technology in the back end. So it means that uh, we develop and establish and maintain really good relationships with those partners and they're the ones who are doing the, the hard yards at the coal face. Great, thank you. And Stefan, for yourself. Uh, so uh, I'd like to maybe uh, highlight two two important items, uh, just as in addition to what has been said, and I think that, uh, as, uh, as as Philip just said, you know, relationships and, uh, and and partnerships are really key in this market. But let me let me just from a person, you know, our very own personal experience, um, highlight two elements. And one is the importance of sustainability, uh, and secondly, the importance of engineering. So what do I mean with that? Well, uh, Germany and like many other countries in, in Central Europe are markets in, in, in transition. You know, there's a big transformation going on right now in the markets, in the industrial markets, as well as in other markets. And that is, um, has to do with digitalization, yeah, that we heard from Paul before, which is completely true. And the second element I like to highlight is, is sustainability. So uh, w when you enter this market environment, yeah, you need to have a clear strategy in place about sustainability. How are your products uh, helping your customers to become more sustainable? Yeah? And this does mean, uh, radically speaking, it doesn't mean that you have a strategy in place to have recycling bins. Yeah? It means real sustainability, answers to CO2 footprint, answers to supply chains, because that has been a big concern uh, in this economy for the last, say, a year. Yeah, I call it the, mostly related to the challenges that we're having with the war in Ukraine, but also with uh, China. Yeah? So having uh, stable and reliable supply chains is a big issue, but they need to be sustainable. So more local, yeah, coming from reliable sources, we need to be able to trace uh, CO2 footprint, we need to be able to trace uh, the production of products, so to avoid, you know, child labor and uh, other, you know, terrible things that can be attached to, you know, when, when supplying from overseas, you yeah? So that is very important. So, and, and your customers will ask about it. Yeah. And I, I really recommend being prepared for that. Yeah. The second element I want to highlight is a bit more also more of a cultural thing. Yeah. Is that um, this is engineering country, you know? So, you know, I'm an engineer myself. And if you ask the, the kids on the street what they want to become, uh, at least 50% of the kids will say, I want to become an engineer with Porsche yeah? or Mercedes. Yeah? So that is still, uh, still a reality, you know? The rest wants to be influencers and YouTubers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fine. So, um, uh, having said that, you know, making a stand on this market largely depends on your engineering capabilities and the evidence uh, that your product has in terms of, you know, uh, USP, as we heard before, technological capabilities, and you need to be very convincing about it because you do enter a mature market with a lot of experts in the engineering space. So uh, I really recommend that uh, you're well prepared in being able to answer all the good questions that are gonna come your way because they will come your way. However, if you are able to convince people locally about the value of, uh, of your product and the USP of the product, you will be able to uh, uh, establish and maintain long-term relationship. There is, so there is definitely a great benefit attached to that. You know, this is true. Even though it's sometimes in eight to ten hours time difference, you know, people do like good engineered products. You know, and that's possible. You know, uh, to 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 enter this market with such products. And I know there's great engineering talent in Australia. I, uh, from personal experience, sometimes feel it's overseen by. Um, 
maybe by the Australians, yeah, uh, and maybe by the Australian government uh, to some regard. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I really recommend and and want to encourage you know, Australian engineering people and companies to uh, to try to come to Germany because I do think that there's great great technology coming from down under. Thanks very much, Stefan. Appreciate. Yeah, mentioning the supply chain and the importance of sustainability. That's a really key thing here. And it's funny because as you're speaking, there's a couple of questions that have come in engineering related. So I'll definitely be hitting you up for that <laughs> later in the Q&A. And Jessica, how about yourself? Uh, so finding customers. Well, we are a services business. So we, um, we do different types of engineering. Um, but to actually find customers in Germany, um, as the other two said already, the most important thing is relationships and peer group recommendations. So for us, um, we are a AWS consulting partner in Australia. And so obviously AWS has a presence here. So it was very important for us to um, foster those relationships here with the AWS organization here. Um, and we also got involved in uh, local content and events. So we basically got involved in the AWS user group so that we get um, to, to talk to the right people. And now we're actually um, co-running and organizing that user group in Berlin. So that gets you across um, a lot of interesting people and have conversations. And um, also, as your guide is stating, it's very important to have uh, relationships with associations. So um, we have um, try to work together with some of those associations on content and um, these kinds of events that they run. Um, and so we also seek out opportunities to speak at conferences and any kinds of events. There's a lot of events in Germany, so it's, um, it's a great um, um, option to get out there. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing is in Germany, it's, it's a lot of face-to-face -face relationship building and you need to be out there and be seen and when you do go to these networking things, um, one thing that it's probably a bit different to Australia, it's very much business focused. So people go there with a purpose and they actually try to get around people and, you know, and um, there isn't so much personal banter than what you would have in Australia at these kinds of events. Um, so it's important that you sort of keep it on business and um, I guess for us in Berlin, we're very lucky. We've actually been able to largely do all of this in English. So um, a lot of, as, as um, Stefan was saying, a lot of Germans actually speak excellent English. So you can have a lot of that um, in English, but yeah, you need to at least try some German as a sort of sign of respect. Um, but what we would recommend is doing that networking in English works really well. But when you come to the actual sales part of it, um, we would definitely recommend having a German speaking sales rep or sales organization, um, because then they usually want to do that in their own language. It just gives them some extra security. Um, and one other thing that doesn't really work in Germany is cold calling. Germans just hate cold calling. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, basically that's been our experience. It's all about relationship building. Okay, thank you very much and good tip on the cold calling because yes, I know in the US often that's expected, but in Germany I've heard too, yeah, it's just people hate it. So thank you. Um, now looking at the battle for talent, there's always talking about trying to find either hiring people, um, trying to find distributors or partners. So um, yeah, so for Jessica, I know uh, we've talked about this. So what important considerations do you need to consider when you look at hiring staff in Germany? Um, it's uh, quite different here to employ people in Germany, I would say, to Australia, having worked in both markets. And I think one thing that Australian companies really need to be aware of is um, the um, additional wage costs that you actually have here when you employ people here. So that's something that isn't in the system in Australia. And what I mean with that is that the German employer and employee actually both contribute to the social benefits. The social benefit system here is much, much bigger. So you have to actually pay health insurance, unemployment insurance, church contributions um, and pension. And all of that is actually ad um, additional to the actual wages. So this, it's a lot more of a complicated structure. 
Additionally to that, a lot of Germans actually get a 13th month salary. They get vacation bonuses. And as a whole, they actually have a lot more annual leave days um, than Australians have. So that's just something to consider when you want to employ somebody. The expectation that you can meet that as opposed to the German competition is there. So you got to be aware of that, right? And another um, interesting fact here is that Germans actually get a lot of sick leave as well. So there's actually, you can get six weeks sick leave for one illness. And that's partially paid by the um, health insurance, but it's also partially paid by the employer. But the main thing is that it's sort of, is a bit of a culture of taking fairly long sick leave. <laughs> so um, it is just something to consider, um, not so much in the management of people, but actually if you wanted to look at contracting, um, it has a huge impact we found on contracting. In Australia, it's very easy to do contractors and you know the fee covers all those ex um, extra um, wages these people want. But um, here, they basically factor in the six weeks of sick leave an employer could take. And so we found um, very interesting that then the contracting rates are very, very high trying to actually account for these kinds of risks that they're obviously passing on to you. So I think that's, um, it's just something to be aware of um, when we were looking into it. It's, um, we were a little bit surprised that it was handled that way. Um, and another thing I wanted to maybe give a bit of um, a recommendation is obviously you might think when you want to come here, you want to send some Australian staff out. Um, and what we found out is that you can actually send Australian staff here for a short period of time. Um, and you, it helps greatly and makes it most cost efficient if you actually send them out on a posting agreement. So that because, um, as uh, Michael was saying, Germany and Australia have um, bilateral agreements in place. So there are certain constructs you can actually put in place to send Australian staff here temporarily for a setup until you actually find um, German staff. And then maybe one last point to mention is there is a skill shortage in Germany as well. So it is a very competitive labor market. And so that's why I wanted to stress that you need to consider the package that you put towards um, your potential employees. There's a, I'd say a fairly high expectation on all these um, additional salary components. Yeah, thanks very much, Jessica. That's really important. And uh, now, of course, we have companies out there I know in the audience that are probably thinking, OK, maybe I want to find a distributor or a partner. So, um, Philip, I know you've been working with partners. Um, what do you need to consider if you want to find one in Germany? So obviously, the networking thing is very important. And so because we had that uh, period in, in Germany uh, and in Berlin when we were first looking to um, test our product in the market, uh, since then, apart from during COVID, uh, we have been back face to face in Germany uh, four or five times a year, myself or my co-founder, our CTO, um, uh, ever since. So um, continuing those relationships, getting warm introductions to, to others, which is um, one of the things that we were talking about, no cold calling. Uh, we never cold call. We only um, ask for introductions from others who that we already know in the market who then provide introductions to somebody else. And it's amazing how willing people are to do that if you have a good trusting relationship with them. So if you already have an established relationship um, and you're doing the right thing by that customer or by that connection, uh, then they're very happy to um, do warm introductions to people and people are much more likely to take your call, take a meeting if, they've been, uh, if you've been introduced uh, in that way. And that's how we got in, we've got three different types of, um, I guess, partnerships or JVs with, with German companies. Um, and they work in different ways. So uh, one of them works as a, I guess, as a, a sales marketing front end uh, for us um, and does some contractual work uh, as part of any of the big projects that we have. And then we hold on to and maintain the recurring revenue aspect of, of our projects. Um, but uh, always back through that uh, through that partner, but they do the initial configuration, um, any kind of content work that's associated with it as well. So that's a really good relationship. It's long-standing. All of our relationships are long-standing. And I'd say one thing about the German market, they're very loyal. So if you're doing uh, the right thing by your customers, 
even when things like COVID comes along, um, they try to stand by you, you try to stand by them, and that, that actually bodes very well for you in the long run. Um, additionally, the, another thing that we did was look for international companies that had an Australian presence um, that we could um, either do testing or initial projects uh, with the Australian arm um, and then use that as a springboard into Europe for us. So we have a couple of worldwide licenses for our technology through international companies um, that have uh, European presence. And uh, that's been very good for us because the Australian arm would then sponsor you into uh, discussions with European uh, entities. And uh, so that we found that to be uh, a very good way to work as well. Um, just on the, on the um, uh, getting employees uh, aspect, uh, early on, we, we took on some employees. I think we took them on too soon. And we also built a, a large office presence. And I think we did that too soon. And so we kind of scaled that back and instead we worked through those uh, joint ventures or partnerships and uh, I guess rent some of their um, some of their employees part of their time to do our support and sales work or marketing work uh, for customers in language. So that works for us uh, very well because it means we don't have to engage in that whole employment process. It works for our partners well because they get a bit of additional funding when there's potentially downtime with some of their employees. Um, and they also get to build out their networks because um, we are selling through them product that they wouldn't normally have. Okay, thank you very much. And next question, this one for Stefan. Um, so Speed 3D, of course, is some very important IP and that sort of thing. So how did you look after your IP legal and taxation when you were here in Germany? How did you tackle that? Right, so uh, IP is indeed very important, you know, um, because um, your customers will trust that you uh, open the IP of the products that you're actually selling to them. And they will, if, you, if you're engaging with larger corporates, which we do, for instance, you know, not in the defense space, then uh, they'll make a due diligence on that, you know. So uh, there's always uh, a certification process or due diligence process or some some sort of compliance that you have to uh, go through in order to engage with large organizations you know i'm talking about huge corporates in, the, in this you know it's, it's different with the smes obviously so having a, an ip base is really what's expected you know uh, if you don't have ip then you're not a tech company yeah so um i mean we can discuss what what is ip really all about and what you know especially in software what does it mean but you know what will impress people is having if you have a long list of IP that you filed. You know? So, being very practical about it, uh, I suggest you do that. You can do this on the Australian market, uh, but really what they expect is you know protection of IP on the EU market and the US market typically as well, and sometimes on the Asian markets or parts of Asian markets. Uh, I know it's for young companies that's a big uh, cost item. You know it's a burden. Uh, but still, uh, I, I, I would suggest that this is um, this is an important important item to watch and to manage very very carefully. You know. Okay. Thanks. And with uh, the taxation and uh, and the sort of legal aspects, how did you tend to source that, Stefan? Well, um, uh, it's you know you, you always find service providers for that. Yeah, in the end, uh, I'd say it should not hinder you from entering this market. I, I know that the Oslo Trade can provide advice and service on that. And typically, if you have a trusted partner, they, they'll give you a hint to a, to a service provider, you know, being a, typically a, a tax consultant or a legal advisor who can handle that. Uh, we, we like to, you know, this is a, sometimes it can be get a bit bureaucratic uh, over here and it's less digital than it uh, should be. Yeah. Uh, that's what I love about Australia. Everything is very digital and fast, but uh, over here it's sometimes not. But you can manage it. Just it may take a little bit of extra effort, extra time, but and it does cost some money. But it's not something that you should that should stop you from doing it. What I do advise is uh, if you are engaging long term in this market to have a local uh, subsidiary like a limited uh, GmbH. Yeah? Otherwise, uh, you'll run on in, into all kinds of funny tax issues. You know? 
because you want to have the taxation locally and you want to have the cost base locally that runs on your uh, on your local entity uh, otherwise it gets really nasty and complicated because unfortunately australia is not part of the european union uh, which means there's all kinds of tax laws applied yeah and we don't have the same level of free trade agreement uh, between australia and the eu at this stage and i really do hope that we can make this happen very very soon yeah no, thank you. I mean, it's good to be part of Eurovision, but not the EU, unfortunately, at the moment. <laughs> so, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, I tend, I tend to agree with Stefan there. Um, I just wanted to add a thing Yeah, The tax thing here is something you want to get on early, like sorted as soon as you get here and have any kind of business, because the German tax authority authorities t are very strict. And so it's um, not sort of the Aussie way. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to just mention is that the ultimate goal would be to incorporate because it op opens all sorts of funding opportunities um, and also a level of trust for German partners. Um, but there is a short term way you can actually um, start off. And um, that's something you need to discuss with your German taxation advisors. And it also comes down to what your the rest of the company set up. But there's a thing called a permanent establishment, which is like a pre step. And I just wanted to um, mention that because um, that would have been nice to know when we started. <laughs> so, um, but it's definitely something you want to get some um, tax advice on. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, that's great input. All right, just looking at the time, we're really kicking along. So what we'll actually do now is we'll switch the Q&A because we've got a nice little lineup of questions um, that have come in already and for the last 10 minutes. So uh, I guess to start with one, um, can you provide a comparison of work and private life balance in Germany and Australia? Which I find is quite interesting. Would anybody like to take a shot at that? Is there a comparison between work life and private life balance in Australia? Is one more relaxed than the other? Is it about the same? Jessica? I would say there is more of a division of that. So um, the, the, the Germans like to attribute a certain part of their day to work and then a certain part of their day to their private life. Um, whereas in Australia, I always found it's more sort of mixed. You know, you have long lunches and you work into the evenings and that sort of stuff. Um, I think that would be the main difference that I can sort of see. Um, but a lot of Germans work very hard and they also expect everyone around them to work very hard. So um, it just seems sometimes a little less play because they're a little bit more serious about it. Okay, thank you. Um, but I guess too, as you say, that's why with Germany, you've got the extended holiday time. You, you work hard, but you also, you've got your six weeks break, which is lovely. So um, an engineering question. So Stefan, um, do engineering design drawings produced in Australia need to be certified by German registered engineers? Uh, yes, um, they do. Um, there's, um, if you want to have something uh, manufactured or sold in this market, you need to have this. Uh, you need to be compliant to regulations. You know, there's all kinds of. Uh, <clears throat> not going into too much detail here. Um, uh, regulations in place uh, with uh, you know how ma machines should be designed, what kinds of parts should be used, um, uh, you know what are tolerances, what are standards. So there's a lot of that those things going on, uh, and uh, so my my recommendation would be to work with the local engineering entity that can help you with that. I mean, there's plenty of them. So as I said, we we don't like engineers, and that it'd be all right, you know. Um, but also, you know, bringing a, a, a product to the market will require you to have certifications, yeah, you know, of some regard. Uh, this is especially true, for instance, if you're in medical technology, so it's probably uh, the, the most difficult ones to achieve. And then if it comes to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, capital equipment, the, uh, different regulations in place. Uh, the good the good news about this is if you are able to comply with that by German standards, and it's it's basically you get the whole European Union for free and most other global markets as well. Yeah. So, but I, I, I you know, I would expect that, um, you know, if you 
do diligent engineering, you'll run into those um, <clears throat> into those um, standards uh, anyways and comply with them. It should be okay. But it, most of them need to have, you know, depending on the market, need to have some some level of approval or sign off by uh, by a local authority or engineering group. Yeah. And would these need to be a follow-up question to that? Would these documents need to be in German, or could you supply the English ones if you need to obtain permits, like the German engineering design drawings, that sort of thing? Would it need to be in German to get it done? Uh, that's a very good question. I would really have to say I'm not 100% sure on this one. Um, I uh, would really have to deep dive into this. Um, uh, but typically, we're pretty good at accepting English ones. Uh, but I would, I would really have to look it up to, uh, to answer your question um, and do some research on that. Yeah. Okay. And again, here we've got the importance, as you said, of having a good network in in the country. That if you don't know the answer, hopefully somebody in your network does. So thank yeah. you. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting question. So my business partner is German and lives in Australia. Is it easier to send him to Germany to open an office? Anybody? Um, yes, I would answer yes, because I'm also okay. German. And so it actually is a bit easier from a work permit perspective and a sort of initial language barrier sort of thing. Um, and perhaps a cultural understanding that you can sort of bring along to the process. OK, no, thank you. So, yes, yeah, so if you do send the German. That'll make life easier. <laughs> um, question. So, and it's a topical one. Has the situation in the Ukraine had any effect on your business activities in Germany? So, yes or no, I guess, would be the question for this. So, Philip, how about yourself? Have you seen any uh, impact? Not, not noticeably. COVID had a larger effect on us uh, because of the lack of travel. Um, and so, we didn't sign any major new contracts uh, during COVID. Uh, we continued with our existing customers and projects that we already had underway. But uh, typically when you're signing larger deals with new customers, the Germans want to sit across the table from you, look into your eyes. Um, they might require you to do a bunch of preliminary testing and certification as we've heard about, especially with our stuff in, uh, in hospital communications, for instance, um, which uh, was difficult to do in COVID. It shouldn't, you, you, think it shouldn't be because of because of technologies like what we're talking on or talking with at the moment. But uh, but in in Germany, there's still that, um, you know, that kind of understanding that until until you're in the room with the decision makers, the deal doesn't get done. And uh, you can do all the speaking that you want with uh, with lots of people who um, uh, may agree that the deal needs to be done. But uh, but there's someone or maybe a couple of people that you need to meet with and potentially go out to dinner with um, that uh, that you need to do that do that kind of face to face work before those deals are done. So mainly COVID was a problem for us. Ukraine, the only I mean, um, I know that people, our friends and our customers have deep concerns and we have some Polish customers and they are very concerned. Um, uh, but in terms of um, stopping workflow, not really from our side. Okay, thank you. I can I can actually agree with that too. We actually have a Ukrainian customer, and um, obviously we're very worried about them when it was all starting. But they are remarkable. They're actually carrying on nearly like normal, yeah. and um, there's still business happening there. It's not like it's all dead you know <laughs> like you see you see the ho horrible pictures and everything and you wonder how they can even think about work but it's it's still going and you know it's a european market so they focus on other markets but yeah it's it's not impacting us too much but we have to be more sensitive and more flexible yeah. um, around it okay thank you all right and there is a question but this is does austrade support australian companies want to expand into the eu market with information and consulting services about european technical regulations for their product and this is one i can take on uh is that what we do is we can provide you again with some referrals um because uh, i myself am not an expert um and as stefan has pointed out for a lot of this you do need to do a deep dive into these things 
So, uh, yeah, what we would do is uh, contacting Austrade. We'd be help, uh, happy to provide you with referrals to uh, uh, consulting partners that can assist in this area. Um, the other thing as well, though, and this is one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar, is you also have an idea now of some of the companies that are actually active in um, in Germany. So, And I know all three panelists are happy if you want to sort of reach out and say, hi, can we just have a chat? just to network and get an idea of what it takes. So one question that actually I get know comes up, it's not in the queue, but it's actually come up a few times in my line of work is, um, can I do some networking into Germany before I even leave Australia? Um, I know Philip has come, mentioned there's a really great idea of uh, talking to international companies in Australia um, to see if you can do business with them first and then use that as a springboard in your network. Uh, any other options or any other ideas uh, that people have done? So obviously the associations, um, so the German Australian associations, um, they have lots of really good um, social events, uh, <laughs> which are worth going to, uh, different in different uh, cities uh, in Australia. Um, and uh, you can, there's all, sometimes trade delegations that come out. Um, we had one recently that came through around digital health that we were involved with. Um, uh, so that's, that's also a good thing. Uh, because that's obviously people who have taken the time and the and the expense to come to Australia to seek out like-minded companies and technologies that they can take back. Um, we also, on, on, on our side, we also do um, networking with the uh, larger health organisations uh, because they often have research projects that run across countries and mm -hmm. so, and run internationally. And that provides a host of uh, very good um, connections um, into other territories other than Australia. Okay, thank you. And I guess just as we're coming to the end, one last thing, what is one point that you would like the audience to take away from this panel? If you had to give one thing that they should remember, um, Stefan, what was the one point you want them to remember? Uh, right, so um, I think, you know, bring on the good in Australian engineering to Germany. Please do. Excellent. That's a point we can all get behind. Jessica, how about yourself? Um, I would say don't expect to do business like in Australia. So um, don't just think you can transplant your product into this market. You have to actually prove that your product works in this market. Germans want to see that proof. Um, and so it should be, um, it's a bit Something you want to maybe try is to get customers in that market before, at least a little bit of interest, um, because you can't really expect sort of quick wins like you can in Australia. It's better to have a long term plan. Okay, thank you. And Philip, yourself. I think um, you can get excited about the German market because um, they don't like to leave a good idea on the table. So if you have good technology, if you have proven technology, if you have um, something which um, they perhaps don't have but they're interested in, uh, they will engage. And I think that that, um, that is something that I've noticed about uh, the Germans and something that, that if you have good tech, um, uh, really plays into your favour. Okay, thank you, all three of you. Those are three fantastic points to, to end on. So, yep, we'll come to the end of the webinar now. So, uh, you can go to the next play, page, please. If you have any further questions, please reach out to me at Michael Henderson at austrade.gov.au, and our Frankfurt trade team will be happy to assist. So, and just quickly, plug for Austrade. So, how do we assist? So, we're the Australian government's International Trade Promotion and Investment Attraction Agency. So, through our extensive global networks, we generate market information and insights promote Australian capability, and we facilitate connections as well as run amazing webinars with amazing panelists. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. I would like to give a big Australian thank you to our amazing panelists, Jessica from Base to Services, Stefan from Speed 3D, and Philip from Liquid State um, for sharing their experiences and insights with you. So yep, two thumbs up. And thank you for helping to grow the next group of Australian tech companies looking at entering the German market. I'd also like to say thank you as well to my Austrian colleagues, Paul and Alyssa, for their time and invaluable assistance. So if you have any questions or would like introductions to our panelists, please contact me by email. 
Um, all three have also indicated they're on LinkedIn, so they're happy to make, make connections that way. Uh, I will be sending out a link to all attendees so you can access the guide, the presentation, and the recording of this webinar. And I'll be sending out a Q&A in the next day. So uh, thank you for joining our webinar and have a great day. Uh, I'd like to ask our panelists to stay on, but we'll say goodbye to our participants. So thank you for coming and have a good day. Thank you.